Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving this snowy morning. It's beautiful, but it's not easy on the roads, we know. So thanks for coming in. Uh, luckily, uh, the topic we are discussing today is very warm. When we think about Cuba, uh, the beauty there, the, the lovely climate, and I think uh, our, our guest speaker and his wife bring a lot of that sunshine uh, with them as they come. Uh, my name is Chris Burkaw. I'm a partner here at Dorsey & Whitney. I head our corporate group in Minneapolis, and I'm an active member of our international practice. Um, I visited Cuba uh, for the first and only time so far in December uh, 2015. I joined a, a study mission that was organized by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture uh, to Cuba, where uh, the attendees there were Dave Fredrickson, the commissioner of agriculture here, uh, and Jeff Phillips, the international trade manager at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, some other members of that trade mission are here, and hopefully we'll hear from them uh, later on in the program when we have a discussion. But we all, uh, I think, to a person, were just amazed at what we saw. It's a place that none of us had, most of us had not visited before. Uh, and there's just so much to talk about and to, to learn about Cuba and, as, and, and, the, and how we're going to develop our relationship together again. Um, today, our, and, and during that trip, one of the highlights of the trip was a visit to the Finca Marca, or the Finca Marta experimental farm that our keynote speaker, Fernando um, Funes Monzote, uh, runs. And he runs it as both an experiment, but also an example of how um, agriculture can evolve and be managed and food production can be conducted in a way that's sustainable and um, not, not only in terms of the quality of the food but the way it's, it's grown. And it's created a really a strong example for the, the farmers around there and farmers throughout Cuba of what's possible. You'll hear more about that from Fernando in our, in our discussion. Um, so the Department of Agriculture contacted me when they were thinking about bringing Fernando here uh, their objective was to introduce him to some organic farmers and ag producers here in Minnesota uh, so, and to have him share some of his knowledge about agroecology that he's learned in his work, as well as to tell folks about what's happening in Cuba and to talk about the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. So we're going to begin our program this morning with Fernando's remarks. Uh, following that, we'll have a brief question and answer session just with Fernando, but then in the second part of the program, the second hour, we've, we are assembling a panel um, to talk about various issues relating to Fernando's remarks, but also kind of the Minnesota view on doing business in Cuba. So to start us off, I'll ask Jeff Phillips uh, from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to introduce Fernando. Uh, he's been hosting Fernando and his wife, Claudia, here. Claudia is sitting next to Fernando up in the front. Uh, you can say hello to her after the program if you'd like. So Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming this snowy morning. And a, a special thanks again to uh, Chris with Dorsey and also with uh, Jane here at Dorsey, who's a uh, I've worked, we've worked with a number of programs throughout the years and a great asset uh, to the community here on agriculture and the international affairs. Um, the reason we're gathered here today is, uh, as Chris mentioned, we did a, a trade a study mission to Cuba back in December of 2015. And uh, probably uh, who we took along on that mission was primarily a lot of our larger commodity councils, a few food processing companies. So we have or groups here that came back from the corn, soybean, feed and grain, dairy, uh, and some other ones. So uh, one of our highlights was uh, visiting uh, Fernando and Claudia's farm outside of Havana. So uh, that was a great experience for all of us. I think we probably ranked that up as our top project. Um, and then follow up in on that, uh, every year the Minnesota Department of Agriculture does a large organic conference. So we do that in St. Cloud uh, coming up tomorrow and Friday. So we uh, invited Fernando to be a keynote speaker there in the dead of winter. 
uh, to come up from Cuba uh, in the middle of January, so he accepted. So uh, tomorrow we'll be off to St. Cloud, where uh, Fernando will be a keynote speaker at our organic conference uh, up in St. Cloud. So um, again, we're pleased to have him here and Claudia here in the dead of winter to talk about produce. And before I forget, I have brought along an official state of Minnesota ice scraper for Fernando. <laughs> so, <laughs> with, this, with the state seal. And um, so as we're traveling around the next couple days in the snow, your job will be to learn how to use one of these things. <laughs> we, don't, we don't give those out to very many people, so you should feel honored. Um, as an engineer and devoted researcher, Fernando believes that the knowledge provided by science can be successively combined with a heritage of tradition to boost, ag uh, revo to boost revolutionary projects in agriculture. Since 2012, he runs with his family, uh, Finca Marta, near Havana, where he produces organic vegetables that are highly demanded amongst the privately owned restaurants in Havana. So we're happy to welcome Fernando. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, uh, Jeff and Chris, for the presentations. Um, I'm very happy to stay here, even if it's snowing so, uh, so heavy, heavily. <laughs> um, for me, well, thank you for the organizers, for the firm to, to invite me here to talk and to tell you the stories uh, we are developing in Cuba in the last years, specifically about the farm and so on. Um, and for me, staying here as a farmer more than as academic um, is a very big responsibility. Um, it was a big decision. Um, very crucial decision for us as a family to start the project Finca Marta. And uh, if you still uh, don't know, uh, it's in, mem in the memory of my mother. We were doing research together for many years, and we were hoping for a better future of Cuban agriculture, a future linked uh, to fairness and social equity, and uh, looking at agriculture not as only uh, an activity to produce food, but as a way towards improving life in the countryside and generating a better option for people to live uh, better. <laughs> um, uh, well, there are uh, several uh, things I I could tell you, but it is another, uh, another big responsibility to talk about Cuban agriculture and about these transformations and to give my, um, my own views and uh, analysis uh, based on, on, on my whole life linked to agriculture. I was born in, in a research station close to Havana. Uh, it, is, uh, it was the Animal Science Institute. My parents were researchers there. So from my childhood, I was very linked to agriculture, uh, to all the discussions around that. Until today, uh, that was the uh, most important part of uh, time I dedicated in my life uh, was about agriculture. And it's a very big uh, pleasure, I am very proud, to share this, um, these ideals and, and, and this uh, action with my family. Uh, Claudia is here uh, and has been a, a very big supporter for the project since the very first day, since before. <laughs> Since before it started, we were thinking how to, uh, to give our, uh, our time, our efforts uh, uh, to dream together as a family uh, for a better future in the Cuban agriculture. And I am not a Cuban official, 
as I told a year ago when I was invited by The Economist uh, to a summit in Washington. I'm not a Cuban official, but I'm officially Cuban. <laughs> I, told, I told them. Uh, so um, I, I have that responsibility, uh, uh, that responsibility as a Cuban um, to present uh, views that, are, uh, that match with our common dreams. Uh, when, when I tell common dreams, uh, it's, it's not that I'm thinking about uh, my family, about the people around the farm and all the, let's say, the influence that the, the, the project is having in, in, the, in the area, but also uh, the common dreams, um, other Cubans living abroad, living outside Cuba, and also uh, the common dreams with people that want to help Cuba to go ahead in the best way possible. Um, I, I have uh, prepared this presentation. Uh, it was in a rush because I really uh, am very busy these days. I think uh, more and more busy than when I was uh, uh, an academic. And, and to prepare these presentations, now we are preparing a, a book uh, to tell the story of the farm, and we cannot find uh, the time to do it. Uh, so I have prepared this presentation with some slides, with some ideas, thoughts about what uh, are the views uh, that I can give you about sustainable agriculture and food production in this moment of uh, changing Cuba. There were some questions that the organizers uh, sent me um, that guided uh, in some way my my slides, and others are uh, from my. I, I prepared this one um, talking about the, the features of a Cuban agriculture uh, history. history. And uh, we have three, let's say, contrasting models. First, we have this colonial model of uh, agriculture, an instructive model, uh, led by deforestation, uh, Slavism, monoculture, export-oriented um, uh, products, and natural resource over-exploitation. Uh, that happened through about 300 years in our country after uh, uh, Spaniards came to, to our island uh, with the idea to conquer uh, the new world. Then uh, we have another model that uh, it is very difficult to uh, identify where was the, the specific moment when it started, uh, and it's the industrial model. The industrial model came with the sugar mills uh, that uh, domain the Cuban countryside in the second part of the 20th century, uh, but also the industrial model was reinforced with the revolution, with the ties uh, uh, um, between Cuba and, and the socialist countries. The industrial model was uh, really expanded in the country with the idea of improving people's life, improving the capacity of the country to generate benefits for, for people uh, widely. And it was established uh, mechanization, a high dependence on, on oil, large cell, uh, scale infrastructures, a huge impact on the uh, natural environment, big economic and financial fragility, and uh, migration to the cities. If at the beginning of the revolution there were like 75, 80% of the people living in the countryside, uh, in a few years there were only 20%. Uh, it was a big shift towards modernization, industrialization uh, of the countryside, uh, expecting for improving the lives of these people that were uh, starving, that were stagnated in the countryside, and that were living in a very poor conditions uh, of life. So access to education, to a medical care, to good infrastructures, et cetera, was a name of the revolution at the beginning of the 60s. And uh, there, there are two uh, facets of our uh, agro uh, uh, economy, and is sugarcane and cattle. These were the two main uh, activities developed for the whole Cuban uh, agricultural history. And, um, Sugarcane uh, cutter, uh, cutting is, is one of the hardest works 
uh, you can make, uh, stay cutting uh, sugar cane. Uh, and th there was a discussion uh, about that at the beginning of the revolution. And one of the measures taken by the government was to industrialize and modernize and mechanize uh, sugar cane cutting. I have um, uh, a friend and a colleague and uh, a farmer working in the farm in our Finca Marta, and it's Juan Machado. Juan Machado was, uh, for many years, a sugar cutter. And he was national hero of work. He's a very small man, but very strong, very concentrated in work. He knows how to work efficiently with his hands. And, and he tells stories, uh, very crude stories, about his life cutting sugarcane. Um, so uh, if we are talking about sustainable agriculture, we have to talk about mechanization also of the processes, and we have to talk about what kind of mechanization we would really uh, apply for sustainable agriculture. <clears throat> then we have a white odor, the worldwide record cow uh, was able to produce 111 liters in one day, and as in a lactation period, about 20, 27,000 liters of milk. Uh, it was the, the cow of Fidel Castro. <laughs> he visited many times this cow and was a success in news. And in those times, there were many researchers taking uh, uh, data about the cow and so on. But uh, uh, has been seen as an icon for the industrialization and the modernization of Cuban agriculture. But the, the, the true uh, for the development of the livestock sector in Cuba is, like, um, is that it, it was a disaster. Um, the importation of um, hostile breeds um, into the livestock sector in Cuba um, implied loss of dependence because these cows were very dependent on inputs coming from abroad. They were very fragile. And if they have um, very big potential, they showed very soon the weaknesses uh, facing the, the, tropi the tropical climate of Cuba. So uh, this is part of a big debate, a big um, analysis we have to make for the future of Cuban agriculture, because the industrial model uh, in Cuba failed to fulfill the needs of the Cuban population, of the Cuban people, and fail in its own uh, capacity of uh, maintaining the, um, uh, the sovereignty of, of, our, uh, of our country, uh, because uh, it was a model of farming that uh, didn't cope with, really, with our uh, characteristics as a country, as uh, our uh, future. Uh, of our culture. Then <laughs> these models uh, had uh, consequences like uh, huge distortions of, uh, in the agroeconomy, negative impacts on soil and biodiversity, extensive deforestation, low food self-sufficiency, um, high external dependence, um, deeply rooted socioeconomic problems like, um, like the, the um, people going to the cities and, and all the um, lose of many mm, cultural um, mm, let's say mm, things in, in the in the country um, and these consequences are uh, uh, were uh, deepen and deepen through the years and up to the moment when um, it happened uh, the collapse of the of the Cuban economy this um, is um, an example, a classical example, of the collapse of an industrial model as it was built, developed, and, and collapsed. Uh, Cuba uh, uh, industrial agricultural model and the collapse of the model was uh, analyzed by many authors, by many people. But uh, what we can tell is that it was an historical opportunity to redesign Cuban agriculture, to think in other alternatives, and, and to reconform our agricultural structure. Then uh, we went, uh, let's say by default, 
for a, a low input sustainable agriculture model relying on rational use of local resources, input substitution alternatives, um, extensive farming uh, techniques, traditional varieties and breeds, urban farming, um, soil conservation alternatives, animal drought, different kinds of organization uh, structures like a farmer to farmer participatory approaches where people exchange ideas and, and knowledge and so on. Uh, the use of biological control very widely spread in the in the country, and uh, in general, it was a more knowledge intensive agriculture. People started to learn and to apply that knowledge intensively uh, during their um, uh, their time life in in, in farming. Uh, there were many people starting agriculture projects, and um, we can tell that. Uh, during the um, during the 90s, there was a, a very uh, big enthusiasm about uh, sustainable agriculture practices, organic agriculture, agroecology, and many people got engaged. But what about sustainability of sustainable agriculture? How we can hold a sustainable agriculture for the future? What are the drivers that um, assure that these projects could go ahead and continue improving the lives of people, improving the society, and keeping the, the advances and the, and, and, and the solutions they, they have been creating. And that has been very tough, very difficult. Um, many of the projects uh, stopped. Many people went back to the, to the cities. And it's because it is not only uh, necessary to, to release lands, to, to give lands to the people, but it's, it's, it's part of a whole concept of social development. And the most important in this social development is the mindset of people. How people are really prepared to transform their, um, their ways of thinking about how to farm. It. And at the same time, it needs a structure that assures what people need to apply the new way of thinking. And that was not available. The government didn't have, during these years, enough funds to reconstruct Cuban agriculture. Even for, for rich countries, it's very difficult because the structure for farming uh, at big scale uh, works under the, um, under the notion of uh, productivity and, and economies of scale then uh, you take advantage of, of the machinery, you take advantage of the lands, you take advantage of the natural resources, and in some way you exploit the natural resources, and you need less people, uh, oil is very important, and so on. But uh, when you want to reconstruct all of that to the smaller scale, then you need lots of resources in order to establish the new structure or the new matrix of agriculture. That's the the big dilemma in Cuba. And many people write articles telling that uh, sustainable agriculture in Cuba failed uh, to, to feed the people and failed in many ways. But I, I think um, it was a, a very big and deep learning process for, for, the Cuban, uh, for, for the Cuban society. And we are prepared, really prepared um, uh, structurally and prepared mentally to give, uh, uh, to make a jump towards a new. That jump is, is very difficult. You need lots of uh, different factors, but um, um, the most important is to define right policies uh, that uh, could allow people to develop their own ways of protecting what we have in our, in our countryside. It's not that the government is going to tell people how to farm. The people should have the capacities, the possibilities to, to lead their own processes and uh, to fail in, in the transformation because agriculture is multifunctional and it's locally adapted. And in the conditions of Cuba, uh, we had as much resources as we could not imagine in the 70s and 80s 
brought from, from the socialist countries, and, and it's not uh, enough to have lots of resources in order to make agriculture functional and productive and sustainable. So you have to account of people. And something that, um, that most of the people um, thinking in Cuban agriculture uh, is like uh, we, we don't need much people in the countryside. We need, again, to establish uh, an industrial system and, again, to establish uh, um, machinery and the dependence on oil and so on. But I think the most important factor to develop the future of Cuban agriculture, no matter of what model uh, in terms of uh, production we apply, is people in the countryside farming and protecting, safeguarding our, our nation, our countryside. So that's why uh, we started this project, Finca Marta, and, and we want to stay there for the future. It's not a project for five years, for 10 years, it's, it's a project for life. And we are going to protect, to safeguard that piece of land, of Cuban land, uh, and be able or, or be ready to interact and to, and to, um, uh, and to receive help or, or to receive collaboration, let's say, not help, but collaboration, and at the same time to collaborate because, for example, we are receiving lots of uh, visits from universities in the United States, and they want to, uh, to bring students, to bring groups of students, they are bringing groups of students, to talk about the factors leading uh, the, the sustainable agriculture systems and, and to discuss and so on. And it's a kind of uh, interaction, connection between two realities, two different um, perspectives, but talking about the same topic. So we can build new... Uh, new ideas uh, together. Um, there are three main trends that we can identify during, during these um, years after 1990, after the collapse of the, of the socialist countries and the Cuban economy and agriculture. And one is from monoculture to diversification. That happened. That happened in the country. Uh, agricultural systems were diversified uh, in terms of uh, numbers of um, species, uh, let's say, breaking monocultures and so on, but also uh, is diverse, diverse in terms of ways of farming. So uh, agricultural systems were heterogeneized in, in, some, in some way. The second uh, main trend is from centralization to decentralization. We had farms uh, 150,000 hectares big. So you can imagine in, in a country like Cuba, uh, about uh, 11,000 square kilometers, a farm of 150,000 hectares. It was a cattle farm in the middle of the, of the country, and there were many that, uh, that big. Stayed on, but uh, uh, with very good purposes in, term, in social terms, but at the same time, um, very dependent, very inefficient, uh, very unproductive, uh, and uh, many bad, let's say, trends occur in, in the centralized uh, model of, of agriculture in Cuba. I would say similar to what we had before the revolution, because no matter what kind of uh, ideology you have, if you are uh, farming against nature, you are going to have the same results. No matter if you think capitalistic or socialistic, if, if you apply, let's say, transgenic crops in, in your farm in Cuba, it's, it's going to have the same results that if you apply uh, transgenic crops in terms of, let's say, uh, impacts uh, in farming and, and so on. Then um, another trend is from food imports to food self-sufficiency. And that was the, the main trend, let's say, the idea it uh, was during all these years to achieve self-sufficiency. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a bit. But um, I, I can tell um, something first. In the, in the uh, 80s and 70s, we imported a lot of food also. We had an export-oriented agriculture, but we were importing more than 50% of our, of our food. And at the same time, I, I could say that um, we, 
uh, there are many articles telling that we are dependent 80% or 90% on food uh, imports and, and so on. But there are uh, other factors influencing that, uh, those figures. I'm going to tell you more about that. Um, land tenure changed uh, completely, let's say, uh, from about a 90% uh, tenancy for the, um, for the state to uh, about 80% of the cooperative and, and private sector uh, these years after 1993. A, a big jump, uh, this is a, uh, oh, okay. Uh, a big jump was here in 1993. The government realized very soon that it was impossible to maintain these big enterprises without oil, without machinery, without all those inputs coming from, with uh, feedstuffs coming from Russia. We, we were importing more than 600,000 tons of feedstuffs for our cattle every year. So the dependency was very big and uh, the government realized that very soon. So in, in 1993, the, the state farms were split in smaller units, still big units, but uh, 10 times smaller than, than before, or 15 or 20 times smaller, uh, in a kind of human scale that could be managed without much resources from abroad. That created the conditions for people to go back to the land and to start farming in a very precarious way most uh, of the times. But they were uh, created these new cooperatives, uh, UVPCs, that started to be very important in the, in the Cuban landscape. Uh, they were, uh, until now, in general, very inefficient. They replicate many of the same mistakes uh, that uh, the state farms had. And uh, they didn't achieve very good results. So the debate now is how to, to build a, only one cooperative system for Cuban agriculture. Not several, because we have a CPA, a Agricultural Production Cooperative, and CCS. These are different kinds of cooperatives uh, relying on different ways of organization, different uh, um, regulations, and, and so on. So we, uh, we are discussing at this moment, uh, and, and there is a new law for cooperatives in the country, that is going to, to unify um, the, the, the different factors uh, influencing the um, uh, life on, on, on these uh, cooperatives. And individual farmers. As you see, cooperatives and individual farmers uh, have, like, uh, let's say, um, about 70, yeah, 80% of the Cuban landscape. That was in, in 2008. And that trend continue, continue to be uh, um, implemented during these last years. I have not recent figures, but uh, uh, what I see in, in practice is that uh, most people staying in the countryside are having more capacity to take decisions and to, to, to lead their own process. Uh, this is what I, I was talking about, about decentralization. So uh, cash crops uh, were reduced 10 times, and citrus and fruits were reduced in enterprises were reduced in 20 factor, and cattle 17, let's say from 28,000 to 1,000 or 2,000 or so. Uh, I'm going to speed the uh, presentation. And uh, this is one of the problems. That's my lava car. <laughs> And these are the mangoes we produce in July, August. Uh, and we have a problem to process this mango. Uh, this is what happens, let's say. Uh, I, I have another picture I, I'm, sh I'm going to show you. Um, it's in another, in another slide. Um, but talking about foreign uh, investment and sustainable culture, threats and opportunities, that was one of the questions for, for this presentation. Um, I, I can um, tell that external investment improved production, uh, could invest, uh, could improve uh, production, processing, and commercialization in our uh, agriculture system. 
we need definitively uh, some new um, technologies in order to modernize the system at the different scales, from, from very small farm to bigger farm. That is happening in some way through different uh, aids that we are receiving from different, different countries. But, that be, uh, but beyond that, we, we need to think very clearly on the, the capacities uh, and, and not only of production, but also of keeping what is being produced. Uh, so this is about processing and commercialization to um, strengthening the, the ties between consumers and producers and so on. I'm talking about later. Um, creation of well-paid jobs in the countryside is crucial. Uh, we are testing that in the, in, the, in the last five years. We are increasing salaries for people working uh, with us. And uh, the, the people, of course, have expectations to improve their, their life. When they see that they are improving, then they engage better and they, they see that uh, their work uh, is, is worth is, is important for their families. The scale factor is very sensitive. We were talking about that. Uh, more cautiously to replicate a heavy dependence on external inputs. And uh, of course, uh, there are now about 50% of the Cuban lands that are abandoned in, some, in different ways. Uh, if we have 7 million hectares of agricultural lands, about 3 million and something uh, are basically abandoned and not being used properly and with good, uh, even if many of the idle lands were distributed in the last, in the last years, there are many uh, huge uh, areas of, of fertile lands that are not being used. How to, how to reconstruct this, these areas, how to start farming in these areas uh, without replicating the, 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 the models of, of dependency. So um, I know it's, uh, it's very difficult to establish in the whole country the small farms uh, system and, and even sustainable, many of them is going not to be sustainable, but what is very important is to put rules for, for the future of farming in country, in, in, in Cuba, uh, when we are thinking about external, um, uh, external investment. This is what happened in, uh, in the farm in the first and uh, in the second and third year. We have more conditions to process this mango that is very, um, very good, uh, uh, very tasty, very good mangoes, but most of them are getting spoiled because not conditions to process and to make it, uh, uh, um, let's say, um, commercialized. Uh, with consumers. And at the same time, now to find a mango juice in, in Havana is very difficult. So if we process well what is being produced, in, in, the, in the case of mangoes, maybe uh, there is more than 60% of the mangoes produced in the country, or maybe more. I, I don't have a right figure, but it's my guess. Um, it's, it's getting spoiled every year. So I, I defend the notion that it's not it's very important uh, what you are um, producing, but what you produce that is, is uh, not spoiled. Uh, then uh, strategic investments could promote better use of local and renewable resources. Um, and if we see the future of Cuban agriculture as, as a country that develops sustainable agriculture and not replicate the same mistakes that are being um, replicated for many years around the, wor around the world, uh, we can make that jump, that step forward, and to build um, together with other uh, companies and other people from around the world, uh, thinking in a new uh, way of agricultural system uh, in, in another model. And I'm sure that many of the enterprises uh, could think uh, about that and could open even a small window uh, because we are not talking about um, a difference. Cuban agriculture is not going to make a difference in, in food production in the area, or is not going maybe to, to make a difference for many of the enterprises uh, thinking in investing in the country. But the difference can be made uh, by the way we could farm. 
uh, in the future or in the future projects. And if we think in sustainable agriculture projects, if we think in a more diversified and more um, uh, environmentally friendly agriculture, organic, agroecological, more linked to society in general, not only Cuban people, but people coming from other countries uh, to enjoy the Cuban weather and to enjoy uh, the holidays or to live in Cuba certain time of the period of the, uh, of the year and so on, then we could see uh, Cuba as an experiment to implement a healthy agriculture. Wide, uh, widely uh, at, at big scale. And, and that's the, the challenge for, for the future of our agriculture. Um, and I think it's, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Uh, we could do that together. And of course, I, uh, to put in practice these views, maybe I would need to, to be the president of Cuba. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's uh, still a dream still an utopia, but uh, I'm sure that it's completely possible to put in practice a, a system that is, um, um, that, uh, is um, uh, pursue equality, uh, uh, pursue justice for people, and, and the justice in the, in the context of the food system. Then um, we have the diversification of production and multifunctionality uh, that opens a wide range of, possibility, of possibilities. We are talking about, in our project, we are talking about improvement of salaries, of incomes, improvement of the eco farm economy. But we are applying uh, different kinds of methods, very diversified, very complex and dynamic. And uh, more and more is easier and easier for us to put in practice all, all these ideas together, they mash very well. When you work in, in a, in a um, uh, specialized uh, monocrop, then you try to control the factors uh, threatening the system or the factors that can, uh, yeah, I'm out of time. <laughs> That's, uh, Claudia is always my timekeeper. <laughs> She's the boss. <laughs> She is the boss. She tells me what, when to stop, the, the, the right moment to stop. <laughs> uh, well, and multifunctionality is very, is, is very important in this, in, uh, in this context. Uh, we are talking about uh, agro-tourism. We are talking about nature conservation. We are talking about uh, not only nature conservation, but also um, research uh, about nature uh, environment, about the, the different relationships between uh, Cuba and the other countries around, the migration of species and all, all these things. Uh, regulations are needed to avoid environmental damage to protect local farmers. So we need to regulate uh, uh, many of the, of the future uh, projects. Uh, this is uh, one of the views of Finca Marta. We, we were building this, uh, these uh, walls of uh, rocks collected in the farm. We, we came in, in, into, into a very poor environment, let's say, very rocky area uh, with lots of difficulties, and we started converting the difficulties in, in solutions for, for the functioning of, of the farm. Uh, uh, another question is, uh, there is a food crisis in Cuba? Um, I don't think that there is a food crisis. The government takes care of, of uh, feeding uh, of, the, of the people. Uh, if you went to Cuba, uh, you didn't see people starving, people, um, in, the, in the 90s, we, uh, um, we suffer the, um, the rigor of, uh, of the lack of food. Uh, many of us, I, I lose uh, lots of weight, and my father and my, everybody lose a lot of weight for the lack of, of food in very extreme situations. But more and more people are, are are well, and, and one thing is, is, is very important is to connect uh, food with health of people. And healthy people are, are, are well fed, no? uh, in some way, because we, uh, we have lots of difficulties in, in our diet, in our daily diet, uh, as part of the Cuban culture, about, uh, as part of the importation of some food that is not, is, it's a kind of junk food or, or not uh, 
very healthy or uh, good quality, but uh, in general terms, you see Cuban people uh, well. Um, so universal countrywide food distribution system, a ration card that is not, it's a basic basket, it's not enough, but it's something that people receive every, uh, I would like to, to stop uh, that, uh, that uh, basic basket, but for many people, uh, it's a guarantee, it's a security, uh, maybe for others not. Maybe what we have to do is to identify whose people really need and whose people not. Uh, and, and that would be um, something very interesting in a kind of threshold because some uh, undeveloped countries want to, uh, to apply this kind of zero, um, zero, farm, uh, zero hunger country or something like that, like in Brazil. I don't remember the, but uh, we, uh, all the people in Cuba have assured a certain amount of food and the threshold is, is higher. It's like with education or with other um, guarantees we have in Cuba that the threshold is high, then we can build on that from, from one uh, level. Then uh, diverse channels of distribution of local foods not considered in statistics. There are most of the foods that are distributed locally that are not considered. And uh, people say uh, Cuba only guarantees fifty percent of the of the food for local consumption. But we are having also four million tourists. We are importing lots of food for tourists also <clears throat> to cover the the, the gap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, widely spread network of non-regulated -regul basic food basic foods at slightly higher uh, um, prices. Um, I say higher prices, but assure for not very high prices, I'm sure, for most of the people that can access when they lack of uh, kind of uh, food and so on. And uh, there is a network, another network, or higher price uh, food. Uh, this is a, a more complex uh, um, uh, topic, but uh, let's, let's stop that. Um, well, imported food for distribution through different channels. And it is, it's more or less the, the same that, uh, that before. Um, another uh, countries implemented sustainable farming, uh, farming from Cuba, where the Cuban sustainable agricultural system has been an inspiration for many people around the, around the world. Uh, thousands of people participated in sustainable agricultural congresses in Cuba, and we had the possibility to exchange directly with many, many, many people around the, around the I remember in the year 1992, when we started the the organic movement in Cuba, um, we had lots of people coming from the U.S. And the first Congress in 1993 uh, was like 80% uh, uh, people from, from the U.S. And, and my library, I, ha I moved the library to the farm, is like 60% books and uh, materials from, from the U.S. So we had a big influence from researchers working in agroecology and organic farming here in, in the U.S. The congresses were a very important connection uh, of Cuban people working in sustainable agriculture with, with the rest of the, of the world, not only to tell the experiences, but also to take what, uh, what uh, was important to, to implement in the country. Um, there are many reports on the advances of, of the Cuban agriculture uh, sustainable system, and some countries are Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, there are many programs, for example, to replicate in some way or to implement the Cuban urban farming system in many of these countries. The urban farming system in Cuba has been, uh, let's say, very well organized and politically uh, supported, and, and, and we achieve many good results, and we have lots of challenges also to develop. This is uh, part of the team of, of Finca Marta, and the role of cooperatives was another, another question. Um, organization of farmers' pro production purposes is one of the, of the roles. Um, arranged with state enterprises the provision of inputs for farmers, uh, fulfill the contracts and commitments of production with the state, uh, so to organize that and to fulfill these uh, commitments uh, and, and be able to commercialize through different um, channels of commercialization and follow local and national strategies towards food provisioning, uh, provisioning to the population. 
in a conversation I had recently, a year ago maybe, uh, um, I was reflecting about cooperatives. And I, I came with the idea that in Cuba, people belong to the cooperative. But we need that the cooperatives belong to the people. And we didn't make that step still. We need that appropriation of cooperatives in order to take new measures or new decisions and new uh, ways of organization that uh, differentiate what really people of the cooperative uh, want. So what are the goals of every cooperative that uh, cannot be homogenized uh, in, the, in the whole country? These are the, the cherry tomatoes we produce in the farm. Maybe, maybe we are the, the biggest producers of, of cherry tomatoes in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> We produce about uh, 250, 300 pounds two times a, a week. And it's not much, but uh, in, 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 in a small greenhouse here, you could produce several times that. But uh, we are entering in the market with several uh, different choices in order to um, value what we, what we produce and what we do in the, in the countryside. Well, motivations to start the project Finca Marta, a better life for our family. Not a better life means uh, only more money, but a better life in, uh, in general. Uh, we had expectations to, to, to live in a better environment, to live. Uh, and, and we had all the time that commitment to improve life of other people. Uh, that uh, put in practice um, the agroecological concepts, help improving people's lives in rural areas by creating well remunerated jobs, uh, demonstrate the economy, economic feasibility of our ecology that has been questioned um, for many people. The economic feasibility, people see agroecology as a subsistence agriculture, but we see more and more um, how it can improve the economic of the farming system, the economy of, of farming system. Um, when we are talking about um, agroecology, excuse me, that I, I didn't conceptualize agroecology and organic farming, uh, it's in, 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 in a way towards organic farming. And organic farming is in its own way towards agroecology. They share many, many uh, common um, ways of thinking and, and, and values and so on. But at the same time, you can find an agroecological system that is not organic because it's not, uh, um, let's say, um, fulfilling the, the, um, the, the standards of organic farming. And uh, many of our ecological systems still rely on chemical inputs and, and other uses of chemical uh, uh, to control pests and so on. But at the same time, many of organic farming systems uh, does not, uh, they do not cope with uh, the concept, the social concepts and environmental concepts of agroecology. So they are like in, in the middle of the way each other. Um, then searching for integrated solutions for the development of agricultural system uh, is, was one of another motivation. For me as a researcher, it, it was a, a big um, uh, uh, goal. So. Uh, through our own project, through our own uh, life experiment, um, we could show the people how in practice uh, could be done. And from that practice, we could build a new theory. So we built a new theory with people sharing uh, different uh, solutions and, and results. This is our house in, in, at Finca Marta. We built, uh, I think, a nice house. Uh, we feel... Uh, happy with uh, the house because we see um, that it's very important to create uh, good conditions for people to live in the countryside and, and the expectations on that. There is another factor very important is the legal structure to develop our project. And when I tell our project, I could uh, talk about any other project in the country because it's based on national um, laws and, and, and legal uh, Possibilities. First, legal framework. Yeah. Um, first, um, the private ownership of, of the farm, of the, uh, of the house. We have the the the, um, uh, the ownership of the of the 
of the house. Then uh, we have a special power for administrating the farm operation. The farmer holding the, the, the property of the farm, it's a private farm, is 97 years old now. So he gave us a power to farm the land until uh, he dies, if he dies before me, uh, then uh, I have the possibility of succession of him. Uh, I ask for succession rights and then uh, I success him. Um, we have a license for wholesale distribution and for direct selling of vegetables. And we go to the market every week, two times, selling the, the products in, in, different, in different places. We have a sanitary certificate for vegetables, commercialization, and consumption. So it's uh, regulated, that you need the, uh, that kind of permission. A license for occasional rural work for 14 workers. So everyone has a license to work, to develop that activity. And at the same time, uh, all of them, like me, pay taxes for all the activities plus a 10 percentage of our incomes at the, at the end of the year. So this kind of um, system to pay taxes, and uh, I don't know how to say in English very well, the, 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 uh, the payment of um, revenues or, um, is, is, is very well structured now in Cuba, and it's improving the capacity of people to, um, uh, to be able uh, to help the, the, the country economy. Veterinary license for honey production, an official contract for selling products and buying supplies. Uh, sanitary license for, uh, and permission to develop culinary activities at the farm. So we have, uh, a, let's say, a restaurant to develop uh, gastronomy uh, at the farm, and then it's another, another income. Uh, veterinary license uh, and cattle tenancy permission. So uh, with this, I, I can tell you that uh, we are developing lots of different activities. And that multifunctionality gave us uh, the possibility to improve the economy of the farm. When we are thinking in the territory, this year we aim for uh, starting five to 10 new farms. Uh, we want not to replicate the ways we were doing, but we want to replicate the, the concept the principles and, um, and the structure uh, we have uh, established during this year at the bigger scale. And we are thinking now, in, uh, for the next year in, a, in about 25 square kilometers of uh, diversified farms getting established in the area uh, with people working and developing different kinds of activities. Then uh, results so far uh, in, the, in the farm uh, have been uh, job creation with gender equity. We have uh, seven women working at the farm now and not only uh, gender equity, but also conditions to work and guarantees for people working the farm. Uh, from our incomes, we pay the social security plus the taxes, and all that uh, is consumed during the during the day is guaranteed by the guaranteed by the by the system plus the the salary that is increasing about uh, every six months or every uh, twelve months, depending on the capacity of improving the salary. And we are paying a lot of attention to that because people have to see that their lives are improving based on what they are doing. And they are uh, increasing incomes, greater impact on local economy, increasing production and productivity, national conservation practice supply, and renewable resource use, and being uh, um, beginning a territorial uh, approach. These were three senators coming to the farm uh, one year and a half ago, more or less. And Senator uh, Klobuchar is the senator for Minnesota, uh, still, uh, went to the farm. And we planted this small coconut tree. My father-in-law told me that's the, the, right, the, the, the right tree. Because in the, in the relationships between Cuba and the US, uh, we would take time to make really strong uh, commitment between our countries, our, our people. Uh, and it's better that it takes time, but it's a strong, strong tree. It's very resilient and very resistant to hurricanes. So uh, now the tree, we, we didn't take a new picture of this, but the tree is, is, is very big now. It's like uh, five times this, more than five times this. And so uh, for us, it's like a symbol 
of that visit and for the future of, of our relationship. So thank you very much for, for your patience. <laughs> I took a uh, lot too long. <laughs> no, it was too interesting to have you stop. Um, let me invite the panel to take their seats up here. And in the meantime, um, I'd like to ask the audience if you've got questions um, for Fernando before we start a panel discussion. Uh, you do have cards on your tables, so you can write out a question and it'll be brought up to us. Or you can just raise your hand and, uh, and we'll answer the questions that way. Greg? Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask Fernando a question about the elephant in the room. Sorry? A question about the elephant in the room, <laughs> the, the U.S. embargo on Cuba and how it affects <clears throat> the farm system, yeah. and especially sustainable agriculture improvements in, in Cuba. I'm selling all those mangoes. <laughs> Definitely, if, if uh, the embargo uh, is not ending, uh, uh, finally, um, we cannot go further in our relationship. And, and to build trust and respect and future collaboration, uh, we need to start from, uh, from a good beginning. Uh, the restrictions that are still uh, in place for, for Cuba through the embargo limits a, a lot the, the, the future relationship, the present and the future relationship. Especially uh, all, all this about uh, money transactions and, and all uh, about uh, the, the use of dollars for that apparently were, uh, was, let's say, eliminated, but, but not, in, in practice not. So embargo in it, its own character, uh, still uh, apply, uh, being applied is, is a, a very big limitation for, for all these uh, ideas of uh, fish collaboration. <clears throat> Other questions before I get the cards? Back. Yes, uh, Amanda, you mentioned the importance of uh, external investment uh, coming in. Uh, has there been any overtures from other countries um, uh, showing interest and investment in the <coughs> rural infrastructure or uh, uh, in agricultural areas out there? Uh, we need to think differently. I, I, I was talking about that. And when, when we talk about investments, for example, uh, uh, we see in our project, uh, I think when, when we see the, the Cuban landscape today, uh, we need to see it uh, not fermented, but specifically to different sectors and specifically to different uh, projects. Uh, maybe in, uh, in Ciego de Avila, where the transgenic crops were established uh, during the, the last years of uh, 2010, uh, uh, from 2008 to 2012, about that, uh, you could replicate the transgenic crops uh, there, no? and and then the investments are are based on that. But when you are talking about the structure of um, family farming, there there are lots of potentials uh, to invest in small and medium farms. Now it's being discussed what uh, we call in Spanish pymes, small and medium enterprises, uh, and probably very soon is going to be is going to be released a law for the development of small and medium farms. And uh, talking about the, the, the potentials of uh, small farming agriculture for the future of multifunctional agriculture, not only producing food, uh, we have to, to, to think very uh, seriously about lots of uh, different technologies. For example, uh, when we started five years ago, uh, we didn't have uh, enough water, and we started digging a well. We dug a well by hand, as you see, as you have seen there in the, in the farm, and it was very precarious. It was like showing that we could make that, that hole in the rock, uh, and we took seven <clears throat> months to dig 14 meters deep. But now we have that well combined with a solar panel and a solar pump. So new technologies, 
with old fashioned or traditional uh, ways of farming uh, connected into a new kind of uh, farming system that assures water and uh, in, in, a, in a modern way. That is the investment I, I think uh, uh, would be important to, to think about, but uh, it is very important first to identify what is uh, the structure of the farming system and then later to think which, which technologies uh, you, you really are going to, to apply. Question, Brent? No. Yeah, I, re I represent a grower cooperative here in Minnesota. And from your comments, I can see you've got a probably a complex legal <clears throat> situation to go through in order to affect your goal of creating more grower cooperatives there where the farmers are um, you know, working together to make those decisions. I mean, functionally, the cooperative serves as an interface with a larger market or the government. How do you see that developing for you? I think the, uh, the cooperative system is the guarantee to keep many of the social benefits in society. And we have to, to keep the idea that uh, unifying, uniting farmers, people, in this new scenario is very important for, for the future of farming in Cuba. If farmers are, uh, let's say, fragmented uh, and not... Uh, uh, together, then they are weaker to face the new stage of, of uh, foreign investment and, and new uh, ideas, not only coming from abroad, new, new ideas coming from inside. Yeah. They, they, I would say the mindset of people is the same anywhere. And there are different um, uh, spectrums of possibilities. And uh, there are many people in the Ministry of Agriculture in Cuba thinking in industrial agriculture, rebuilding industrial agriculture when they have the possibility to invest in, 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 let's say, in the livestock sector, they are thinking in mechanical making and they are thinking in uh, mechanizing the processes before um, planting forages, let's say. Maybe it's more important to plant forages to have the, the, the production structure and then later to think in technologies. If you have the technologies before uh, the structure of farming, then it's not going to, to work. See, I, I understand what you're saying. <coughs> I, I, our cooperative focuses on elderberry, which is one of the few products that is hand harvested. So we have to have the small scale. We're very much involved in the environment, but we're using the cooperative as to attract the capital and its growth or its extension of scale and the technology as far as the marketing distribution, really development. Where? Here. Ah, uh, here. In, yeah. Uh, yeah. in the Midwest. We have farmers in Iowa. For the I, I, I would see, uh, I was thinking a lot about the structure, the, the future structure of Cuban agriculture. And I, I would see, I would like to see the future of Cuba as, as a mosaic of farming systems. Of all kinds of different heter, uh, heterogeneous farming systems uh, based on different uh, climatic and and topography conditions in, in the country uh, based on that interaction with uh, nature, people, and of course markets, uh, internal and external markets. And we have more and more uh, the option of exporting inside Cuba because now we are receiving uh, 4 million tourists. And tourism should be an activator of the local economy. And we are expecting before uh, 2020, I think, uh, we, are, we are waiting for a double of uh, 2025. Or so. so we are expecting 10 million tourists, so the same amount of tourists than inhabitants. And, and it's another big threat. So uh, many people coming in, into the island and, um, and changing the, the whole uh, dynamic, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's, it's an opportunity. For example, in our condition, in our project, we only receive tourists one or two times a week. And I take care of that personally. I, I, I make an exchange. Claudia is the chef of our restaurant. And we, uh, we take time. We make a reservation schedule. And we know when people are coming. And that is the kind of protection we need. So developing activities. And what we want for the future is to have 
these 10 new farms with more attractions because uh, definitively if, um, um, agrotourism is a very big opportunity for, for agricultural systems. And if people want to, to, to enjoy, let's say, the Cuban culture and the, and, and the Cuban countryside and landscape and in different ways, then we have to prepare agriculture for, for that, to value that factor that is, that is going to be very important to improve people's life. If we can pay better salaries, maybe sometimes three, four, and sometimes five times the salaries that all the people earn in the in area is because we are going to multifunctionality, to, to value different uh, sources of income and from diff those, uh, for example, we are now um, harvesting honey. We started uh, four years ago with one beehive and now we have 100 beehives. We scale up the honey production. There was not another beekeeper in the area, so we took advantage of that opportunity and uh, we implemented a system that is now uh, well, uh, works very well. Uh, I, I, uh, we go back home uh, on Sunday and on Monday we will be harvesting honey in, in three of our apiariums. We are producing more than four tons of honey. Uh, and in that way uh, you, you can uh, design, design is very important in agriculture. And to make a design that co with, with the different factors, production factors, but also environmental factors, social factors, economic factors, like in Cobra, this, you join people to commercialize together, and then they are stronger towards the market. We could uh, start uh, doing business, uh, international business, for example, with arugula. We can produce a very high quality arugula. And I've seen in, in, in Miami, we stay one day buying some clothes and uh, we stay one, two days in Miami before coming. And uh, we went to the market and we have seen uh, arugula sold by five times a higher price than we sell in, in, the, in the higher micro market in Cuba. So it's, it's, it's a very big opportunity. I could take a, one hectare of arugula I don't know how much can produce. And we know very well, and we have the seeds, and we have the people that know how to grow arugulas. And the most important, uh, apart from exporting and any money, is to um, increase arugula consumption in Cuba <laughs> for Cuban people. And that's, uh, that's the, the, the most important aim for us. So to uh, bring all these um, international or world uh, trends into the Cuban uh, society for the improvement of people's life. Let me bring the panel into the discussion, but I've got some other questions mm -hmm. from the audience that I'll, I'll answer Thank you for the we question. can. Uh, to um, Fernando's left is Shannon Bornson. She is the international sales manager at Seneca <coughs> Foods Corporation here in Minnesota. Uh, and she was on our 2015 study mission uh, to Cuba and visited uh, Fernando's farm. Uh, to her left is Audley Burford. He's the Latin American marketing manager at CHS Inc., which is one of the largest uh, cooperatives in the world, uh, agricultural cooperatives. And he has spent most of his career working in Latin America. He was raised in Mexico uh, and has visited Cuba a number of times. So let me ask Shannon and, and Audley, tell us a little bit about your uh, experience with Cuba, your background with Cuba. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I feel very fortunate. The, the first time I went to Cuba was actually about 10 years ago. Um, I've been able to visit the island, I think, five times over the course of those 10 years. And so for me, it's been very exciting to be able to see changes since the very first time I went there uh, to last December. Um, it, Cuba's always been kind of the forbidden fruit, right, for Americans who are interested not only for business purpose, but just culturally. And I can tell you from the very first time that I went there, um, looking at what was available to us even as tourists at that time in terms of level of hotels, um, restaurants that we were going to were, were pretty much going to people's homes to eat. Um, you don't have the type of five-star luxuries that we would consider here in the, in the US. 
um, to the last trip in December where I saw a noticeable difference just walking down the streets in terms of restaurants. Um, there were restaurants, mojito bars, having happy hour, which was not something you saw before. Um, I saw a lot more in terms of retail outlets, um, <coughs> gift shops, souvenir kind of things that really do show you that there, there have been some changes. And I think for the people that live there, um, the terms of doing business freely is a little bit different for them than it might be for the US, but, but there are things that are changing. Um, my experience with Seneca Foods is, and having food products, you know, Seneca does canned fruits and vegetables. So my thoughts that I'd share with you today are based on a, a retail product selling in that market and what you think are our opportunities and challenges may be for that kind of product. Um, it's very noticeable if you're at all able to talk. I know Fernando talked about it briefly with the, the ration cards and the stores where the Cubans actually go to get their, their staples every month. If you think about um, a retail store here, a Byerly's or a Cub, um, you're going to have to go back decades uh, from that when you look at a retail outlet in Cuba. The, the local stores where you get these staples are uh, really fairly uh, plain storefront. They, they'll have some displays where they'll show a package of you know, what a kilo of sugar looks like or a kilo of rice looks like. They have uh, kind of the, the pricing and some of those on a, on a chalkboard. It, um, it's, it's very crude um, in our terms where people go to get those. There are more modern uh, supermarket formats in the market, uh, but again, very different from what you see here. And unfortunately, what they experience are a lot of uh, stock uh, not being on the shelves. Um, one of the larger supermarket chains that we visited in December, if you went into the frozen section, for example, the shelves were completely empty. Um, I, of course, I was looking at the canned items and you will see maybe three cans, four cans of one item, one brand. Um, so even if you're, you're looking at a more modern format in terms of what's available to people to buy and at what price they can buy it at, it's very different. So from a retail perspective, that can be um, very challenging on how you get to the end consumer. Also, when you're looking at those retail markets, the more modern formats, <laughs> You're having to use a different currency. Um, if those of you familiar with the country are, there's, there's still a, a two-tier currency system where there's the Cuban peso that the locals use, and then there's the CUC, or what you can exchange dollars for. In these more traditional retail formats, you have to use the CUC, which is at a much higher exchange rate. So the availability to uh, some of the people on the island is gonna be a little bit more limited. Um, aside just from where you're able to access these products, I see distribution for us would be a big challenge. And again, I've seen inroads and after visiting Fernando's farm, was very excited to talk to him about that in terms of he's taking care of, of his distribution and helping his customers more easily access his products. Uh, in talking to people who own and manage restaurants on the island, um, you know, food service for us is where we see an opportunity supplying to restaurants the larger volume cans because of some of the limitations in retail formats. Um, so talking to some of the restaurant managers and owners, you, they don't have uh, an inventory in their kitchen like you would here. They don't have stock for weeks. Um, they're basically going every single day out to the market to get what they need. And frankly, um, many of the restaurants don't have a printed menu simply because they will have a menu planned in their head for that day. And if they go to the market and what they need for that menu isn't available, they have to make a split decision on what they're going to do with the menu. So for many of those people having something where they have uh, a distributor that's coming by every day with a truck that has a number of different products, drops it off at their place, that concept is, is really not something that's practical right now on the island. Um, if I had unlimited time and unlimited funds, 
I would love to be able to invest in something there like a modern distribution system in terms of, you know, having a bunch of mopeds like you might see in Asia that are delivering things from my warehouse to these individual people so they didn't have to be making that track. Um, now, having said that, I, and uh, pardon me, Fernando, I forget how many years the um, wholesale market has been there, but on this last trip, we did get to go and see a wholesale market, um, I guess much like we'd equate a very large farmer's market here in uh, Minnesota where it was all uh, fruit, vegetables, things like uh, dry beans, some corn, uh, dry corn, um, where they had actually set up a central market. Uh, people are paying a rent to have a certain uh, space in that market, and people are coming to this central location to buy some of their daily needs. So that was something that I had not seen before, and again, another, um, um, another advantage or another um, Ad advance I had seen in, in the food system since the first time I went down there. Um, the uh, some other basic business challenges you know that we understand in Cuba again um, there it it's such a, a maverick territory you know you go down there and you see so much potential compared to what we have here. Um, and I don't think that there's lack of ideas uh, in terms of what needs to be down there. But we still, as uh, business people, have to deal with some of the practicality of it in terms of, you know, why hasn't my company, for example, why aren't we currently doing business down there? Um, aside from the distribution challenges that, I, that I've mentioned, there are still um, the government uh, regulations in terms of, you know, who can actually access um, uh, I don't want to say contracts, but who can actually authorize the importation of, of certain foods. Um, the payment terms are, it's quite painful for financing. It's, uh, you know, in a lot of um, transactions that we do internationally, um, it's a wire transfer to our bank account. You know, things, things like that are not easy. And we have competitive countries around the world that are offering credit terms and are ably are able to more easily finance these <coughs> transactions, which immediately puts us at a disadvantage. Um, one thing that I thought was very interesting on our trip was a gentleman who is Canadian, has lived in Cuba for quite some time, um, was talking about how the, the priority of the government um, can often upset a, a potential um, contract with a buyer. Um, and I think what he was trying to say about that is, as Fernando said, there are a number of areas that the government is looking at focusing <coughs> on, and some of the investing that they're doing in the country will focus on certain sectors. And if, for example, um, they need to put some funds towards uh, building a new port or investing in their new port area, if they have a contract for food open with the U.S., they might put off that payment, you know, to the producer in the U.S. because another payment is more important to them on a different project. So you you will eventually get paid, um, but it can take it can take time, and many business people are not willing to wait a year, eighteen months, you know, two years. Uh, to get paid for a shipment, uh, and I think most most companies, especially in a retail product or a food service product like we do, um, yes, that's going to be true. Um, the I think uh, one of the other things that people need to be a little bit conscious of, and it'd be interesting maybe if Fernando can co comment on this at some point, is that we have a lot of people living here in the U.S. that have ties to Cuba and are very anxious to have stronger ties with their home country, whether they were born there or their family comes from there. And uh, I have a lot of people that approach us saying, we want to represent you in the market. We want to do business for you in the market. I'm Cuban. Okay, that's wonderful, but that does not mean that you're automatically going to be able to do business in, um, and do it well in the country. You really need to find a right partner um, to help you moving through some of these hurdles. And, uh, you know, Cuba is in, effectively, it's a small country. And there are a lot of relationships that 
have been built in the past. There are a lot of relationships that have been broken in the past. And so it's, I think it's more of a concern that you might find in other markets of kind of understanding the, the history of that person in the market and making sure that um, they would be the right fit. Thanks, Shannon. Um, oddly, how about your... Well, well I second uh, everything that Shannon said. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto on everything she said. Uh, I am Audley Burford. I'm with CHS in charge of uh, marketing agricultural commodities to Latin America. Uh, Cuba has here recently come under my area of responsibility, uh, maybe because I had the uh, pleasure of visiting, having visited Cuba 22 years ago when I was with Cargill. I was on one of Cargill's first trade missions to uh, Cuba back in the middle 90s and had actually not been back until November of this year. So all of the contrasts that Shannon was referring to uh, over her various trips uh, to Cuba, uh, I saw from the first to the second. Uh, and, and indeed, there is a lot of change. There has been a lot of change. Um, tourism maybe being uh, one that caught my attention the most because uh, there was virtually no tourism when I was in, uh, in Cuba in the middle 90s. So uh, all the services that she referred to in terms of the, uh, the hotels, in terms of uh, the restaurants, taxis were something mm -hmm. that was interesting, uh, cabs. This dual economy does present still today a lot of challenges for your everyday Cuban in the sense that uh, things are expensive. Things for, for anybody that, 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 can, that has access to dollars or to the CUCs, uh, things are, are, are very expensive. A cab ride anywhere, unless you take a bike, taxi, is going to cost you 15, 20, 25 bucks to go anywhere. Um, <clears throat> very, I would say, Americanized in, in, in that sense. Expensive relative to, I mean, the stores that you mentioned, uh, the, the retail outlets, uh, food is expensive in the upscale retail stores. Those stores are clearly not available to most of Cuba today. Things are changing. Fernando talked about that. They're changing in a very positive way. Uh, and, uh, and there will be many, many challenges in Cuba in terms of infrastructure, which you also alluded to, uh, specific to food service. But you know, for, for our business, commodity trading, we put, I have to always put Cuba in context too, with all due respect, to Cuba, you know, just take corn. Uh, this gentleman's a farmer, you're in a different different uh, type of agriculture, but, you know, take corn. The U.S. produces 380 million metric tons of corn a year here recently, round numbers. Uh, you know, Cuba's an island of uh, 11 million, uh, give or take. Um, a market that imports last year 1.2 million metric tons of corn down from 1.7 the year prior, has had some other years have been higher. Um, today being done mostly by other countries, the U.S. doing roughly 15% of, of dry bulk commodities uh, business in <coughs> Cuba. So today it is a small market. I mean, for, for, for companies like ours, uh, it is a small market. Having said that, a market that we feel we have to be in, market we want to be in, and we want to be a part of and are very supportive, have been very supportive of legislative change uh, behind easing restrictions um, that have affected us over the years. And uh, we are wholeheartedly promoting the improvement of the quality of life of the Cuban people because that is in our best interest. Uh, back to the tourism, they, I think that's the greatest opportunity that Cuba has today is, is moving that tourism from the 4 million, give or take, today to, you know, 6 million in pretty quick order, assuming that we don't have 
major reversals here in the near future to some of the progress that has been made uh, politically towards the U.S. being able to travel to uh, Americans, being able to travel to Cuba. But I, you know, I see, I see opportunities, and hopefully, a little better controlled than what's happened in Cancun, mm. in Mexico. You know, you we were talking about Merida and Yucatan. Yeah. The 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 industry in Yucatan has basically flourished as a result of tourism on the coast of Yucatan and Quintana Roo, in uh, Cancun and the Riviera Maya. I mean that it's the food service industry. The flour milling industry in in Yucatan and Merida that we uh, that we are big suppliers to, the oilseed processing industry that we are big suppliers to, that uh, interestingly do quite a bit of bottled oil business, <coughs> uh, vegetable oil business into Cuba today in the upscale retail uh, outlets in Cuba. That that all came about and has all grown tremendously as a result of the tourism industry in, in, uh, in the Riviera Maya in Cancun. Um, you will not be able to take tourism in Cuba from 4 million to 6 million anytime in a hurry before building all the infrastructure that that's going to require behind that. Starting with an airport, I mean, starting with airports, uh, you know, roads, ports, uh, Telecommunications coming a long way. That's another major, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, 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 difference. I have a friend of mine in the room here that was kind enough to lend me a, uh, a, a Cuban telephone so that I could uh, stay in touch and went you know, to the phone store and bought my card. They're all prepaid phones and prepaid my phone, and it was very nice to, to be in touch. Extremely expensive. If you're calling outside of Cuba, yeah. uh, you know you can you can go through your hundred dollars worth of credit in in one day, you know, in a hurry. Uh, and I did. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have gone to Cuba to use the phone, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I used it as much as I needed to. Uh, so, you know, we're, that's for us. And I can't speak for for the A, the B, the C, and the D. I've I've worked for three of those four in the past. Um, but uh, I believe for, for companies like ours, um, it's a market we, we need to be in, a market we want to be in, um, and a market we look forward to being in. And we will continue to support uh, legislation in, uh, in D.C. toward uh, uh, making markets more accessible to us. I should point out that on all of your tables, there are handouts that describe in a fair amount of detail uh, the restrictions in place, mainly from the U.S. standpoint of being able to do business with Cuba. You know, in the ag sector, Shannon mentioned this, the credit issue is a huge one. Um, other sectors that can sell, like medical devices that sell into Cuba, uh, can do so on credit. But under statutory law in the U.S. that could not be changed by executive action, um, U.S. companies cannot finance sales into Cuba. They can't extend credit, and they can't use any of our you know, governmental export programs to facilitate um, credit, which is a huge liability. Um, but the other factor that's interesting is just this political dynamic. You know, each year Cuba has bought, at least since the, the not, maybe the, the big hurricane in the late 80s, the food imports from the U.S. have dropped each year. And it's not because the demand has dropped much. I think it's been filled by other countries. But there's one buyer of food products in Cuba, and that's a governmental entity called Allen Best. And they choose who they're going to buy from. Um, the credit issue is a big one, but also um, the geopolitics. We've got such a, a strong embargo still in place that until that's changed, I don't think there's a lot of interest among the the current government in Cuba to open the doors to, to U.S. businesses to sell. Um, we'll see how that changes. Um, Fernando, so do you have any thoughts on what you heard from the others or comments you want to make? Be, well, be kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, I, as I told you, that I feel representative of, of the Cuban people here, as Claudia does. Um, I think um, uh, all Cuban people uh, need to 
in this new stage of, of the uh, Cuban history, need to to really match in different objectives and different uh, perceptions of how to develop the future of our country. But definitively, uh, they, they are uh, very contrasting, contrasting uh, views among uh, people living outside and um, with capitalistic uh, ideas for the future of Cuba, and many of, live, of us living in Cuba with socialist ideas. Um, no matter uh, any of the investments, any of the measures taken to develop a capitalist economy in Cuba, already taken from the very beginnings of, of the 90s, uh, the government decided to start uh, joint ventures with, with um, companies for the development of tour the tourist sector. And since that moment, a capitalist economy was implemented in Cuba and, and it's growing year by year. Uh, but no matter what measures are going to be taken, we have to care about our social system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to protect what we have achieved in social terms. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my opinion, the most important thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. And it's for the benefit of the Cuban people and for the benefit of all the people that uh, are going to, uh, to be collaborating uh, for businesses, for uh, we want to, to uh, improve people's life. And we know that uh, with our weak economy, it's not possible. We need to make alliances with other enterprises, but we have to, uh, to care about values, about uh, uh, the values that guide our society. Uh, and I'm not talking about strictly about the revolution. I'm talking about uh, the values that uh, the Cuban uh, society was building in, in, in all these last years. We need to, to be open, but we need to, to be careful. That's the, that's the, the, the main uh, reflection in my, uh, uh, in my case. And, and to be open, and to be careful, uh, need to, um, to be think in um, concrete projects. If you have a concrete project, a concrete idea, then we can uh, collaborate. And that is about the, the project we, we were developing. We know what we want, not only for our family, for our farm, but for the future of the territory where we live. And we are going to fight for that. Uh, we, we see four main actors in that development for the future. The main actor is the people living in the area. So the farmers, the community, the local community living there that needs to, to, to strengthen their capacities, the capacities to lead the process um, beyond the, the regulations or the policies of the government, the people need to empower in their own territories. Then the local authorities uh, that are in charge of pushing the development and, and facilitating the development. Then the national and international uh, institutions uh, that are in charge of research, education, um, philanthropists, all, all these associations, institutions, and so on, and um, commercial enterprises. If we link these actors together in, in concrete projects, we can go further with this kind of um, of heterogeneous developing uh, of the Cuban countryside. Looking at the, at the people's perspectives, at the uh, policymakers' perspective at the local stage, at the international and national uh, perspectives, and also the business perspective. We cannot see them as a pair. And that is going to be very important to really um, apply projects that are sustainable for the future of Cuban agriculture and resilient enough towards international markets, towards climate change, towards any kind of um, threat that the Cuban agriculture system can have in the future. I've got a question from the audience for Shannon, uh, but it's along those lines, I think, what you were just mentioning, Fernando. The question is, um, farmers and small grower cooperatives in Minnesota, 
um, in the United States face many of the same challenges that Fernando describes uh, for Cuba. And the question for Shannon is what um, programs does Seneca Foods have to work with small scale sustainable farmers or and grocery cooperatives? Um, and I, I'm sorry to whoever posed that question, but I'm, I'm probably not the most versed in that to be able to adequately answer um, that question. Um, that would be something for our egg manager in, in terms of what we're doing with our sourcing. Um, what I can say is with the, the line of products that we have, which goes um, canned corn is our number one, which is obviously a, a very largely grown commodity in Minnesota and, and green peas. And then we go on kind of down the spectrum to doing um, maraschino cherries now, um, some dark cherry products and some organic products where the production and sales of those are much smaller. So the scale of the growers that we're working with on those products are, are much smaller. Um, it's something, whoever posed the question, if you'd like to approach me after we're finished, um, I can find out a little bit more about your specific questions and actually get it directed to the proper person. Sorry. <coughs> oh, thanks. Um, another question from the audience. What is the balance between commercialization of the food system in Cuba and distribution of food to local populations for good health. Um, and each of your companies could play a role in that when you're active, but I'll start with Fernando. So that balance between commercialization and feeding the local population. Well, um, it's very important to see these two strategies at the same time, not super. We are relying, uh, we are as I say, being very dependent in the last years because the weaknesses uh, of, of our food system uh, dependent on imports. Uh, and if, if we can produce valuable pro products at specific places in local conditions in Cuba, like tobacco, for example, uh, and we can sell one, one cigar uh, in 25 or $30, that could be valuable for the development of, of the local economy and the national economy. That's the same for the products that we can sell in the tourist market. If corporates can sell at better prices in the tourist market or in the sport markets, it's an opportunity for the development of the people. And when we sell a, a bag of arugula in, in the restaurants in Havana, we see it as an opportunity to develop people's life in the countryside. And at the same time, uh, we see as the possibility that these people have money enough from these incomes to pay their food and to activate the local economy in other sectors. In a discussion with uh, an economist in, in television in Cuba, I was um, talking about the need not to reduce the price of food, that the price is not the, the main, the most important factor. Uh, the most important factor is that the people have enough money to pay the food. And in that way, it, the people can access the food with their money and activate the local economy. Of course, when you are talking about all the people, equity in the access, fairness, is, is more difficult than when you are talking in other countries about uh, you save yourself. No? Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a good expression. You, you are going on your way, let's mm -hmm. say. The government in Cuba is trying to solve the situation of food um, access for everybody, not for few people or for depending on their uh, capacity, uh, purchasing capacity or so. So uh, I see, I explain myself, or <laughs> maybe it's a little bit confusing. Uh, what I think is that we have to, uh, to see these two strategies together. So valuing the high price products and uh, implementing the possibility to uh, put that money uh, in the hands of people or trying to improve the people's life with that income. Mm -hmm. I see that uh, not only in, in my small farm system, but as a country-wide strategy. You know, it was a specific situation that I referred that question to where it was about the rising costs of vegetables in Havana because of the demand of the <coughs> tourist market on 
the local growers. Yeah. And, and, and it put the price out of those that didn't have access to capital, and the government therefore had to create price reductions so that they could. Yeah, so, price control and so on. I yeah, know. So, so I, I know what you are. What I was referring to. Yeah, I know what you are talking about. There are many factors uh, uh, influencing a price. Not only uh, the shortage. Uh, climate can influence very uh, 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 that shortage. And for example, that happened with tomatoes. Because we have a close economy in some way, a cultural economy, tomatoes are produced and directly sold in our local uh, markets and so on. When there is a certain imbalance with climate, with uh, uh, production, with availability of inputs and so on, then tomato produce uh, production decrease and there is a, um, a crisis. And the crisis go directly to, to the news and the news uh, affect the decisions of policy makers. But policy makers take decisions uh, many times based on, on few factors and not all factors. You have to take into consideration that um, in a certain moment of the year in Cuba, you can produce very well tomatoes like in winter. But in summertime, it's very difficult and the technology is not existent. The prices are going to be affected. And if you have more money to pay that pound of tomato, you are going to buy it. That is, a, a, let's say, a, a law of, of, of uh, market. The challenge is to increase production and uh, people having money enough to pay. Of course, we are going uh, uh, to need a continuing importing tomatoes in Cuba for the next years, uh, specifically during summertime, if we want to eat tomatoes all the year round and for the tourist sector. Uh, there is not the technology to produce enough tomatoes for the whole population and for the tourism sector. What the government did in the, in the past years is to assure what are the, the main staples to be assured for the Cuban family. And as a result, the diet is very uh, limited to, to, few, to few things. So that diversity should be created, generated from the development of small and medium farming systems uh, modernized and with the capacity not only of production, but storage, commercializing directly, and being integrated with the national and international uh, economy through different enterprises that uh, connect to the local and uh, international markets. It's very complex to restructure everything, especially because we had for many years a very vertical agricultural system uh, guided and, and designed it, guided and, and controlled by the government to, um, to distribute or, or to, to, uh, yeah, to distribute that power in many actors uh, is being a, a complex, uh, a complex um, task if you want to keep the guarantees for people at the same time. That balance is very, very difficult. But I, I'm sure that it's totally possible if we see it as some, uh, uh, something to, to address seriously. S sorry to say this. We've got a lot of questions that haven't been answered. But we will have some time after we finish the presentation. We're just about at the hour. So feel free to, to step up afterward and ask the panelists. Um, Ali, I'll let you have the last word before we close. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share with the Well, I, I thought it was interesting in listening to Fernando earlier <clears throat> uh, talking about uh, healthy agriculture. And I, I truly believe from my fairly limited uh, view today of uh, what's going on in Cuba <clears throat> and from the example of having grown up in Mexico, we talked about the ajido system some of the changes in land ownership in, in Mexico, but that seems to be the greatest opportunity in terms of agriculture uh, for Cubans. I mean, the fact that you're looking to better the lives of as many people as you can in Cuba <clears throat> as a main objective, uh, labor-intensive agriculture, I would think, should be the focus. No? I mean, I don't know if 
if you agree, but I mean that corn should be imported. <laughs> Always. Oh, oh, <laughs> it, should, it should be, it should be, it should be, well, that's all right, we can have that conversation later too. But, you know, it should be, it should be, there's no, Mexico's a big importer of corn as well. Mexico will never compete in, they don't have the, they don't have the weather to compete, they don't have the size farms to compete. And so I just, you know, I, it seems to me that that should be the focus. And and and, I'm, and correct me if if you uh, you view it differently, because evidently somebody else in the audience. Does. We uh, we started a, a whole debate in Cuba in the year 2008 about transgenic crops, mm -hmm. especially because uh, the FR uh, BT1 uh, was delivered in the Cuban landscape. After many years, when a hurricane passed, two, three hurricanes passed mm. through Cuba in the year 2008, the notion was that uh, we needed transgenic crops in order to, to assure corn uh, production and corn consumption in Cuba. Uh, after uh, eight years, we haven't seen the results. Mm -hmm. There is a, a technological factor, very important technological factor, because uh, through um, an investment from Brazil, uh, it would be assured that with $40 million, uh, um, production uh, would be enough modernized, enough uh, the technological package would be imported and assure that uh, the amount of corn that could be produced, the, the, let's say the, the productivity would be enough be mm. to cover the expenses and in a long-term project for 10 years and so on. We have seen that all that money was invested in a kind of industrial model, as I was criticizing mm. before, and uh, we didn't get the, the, the return back from that production. The, uh, what is true is that the productivity was very low. The attack of uh, natural enemies of, of corn was high, and it was out of control. It was out of control, um, and the variety uh, originally created uh, BT, uh, FR, BT1 uh, didn't answer uh, for, for productivity. So they are now thinking in, in, a, in a, um, a hybrid variety with the same uh, genetic uh, modification and they are thinking in six tons per hectare. Mm. What I say is that we cannot compete with those, uh, we cannot compete with other countries like the United States mm -hmm. or even Mexico in the same model. How we can compete is producing uh, in a traditional way corn for our self-consumption. Self mm -hmm. uh, there is another, um, another big part that is the corn that is being imported for animal feeding. Mm -hmm. That's another story. Uh, we cannot produce enough corn, and that has been, um, uh, let's say, proof for many researchers, we cannot produce enough corn to feed all the, the animals we grow in Cuba with the, the systems, the agricultural systems we have. And maybe we are going to need to continue importing for animal consumption. That was part of the debate for transgenic crops. But for home consumption, for people, consumption, we can produce enough corn if we base the production system uh, uh, to, um, following, um, let's say, sustainable uh, farming uh, techniques. Yeah, and maybe I wasn't clear in my comment because when I said you know, healthy, specialized foods is what I meant. And I was considering non-GMO as something that should be grown in Cuba. And imports for animal feed. And I should have been clearer on that maybe, which is the model we have in Mexico. You have 20 million metric tons of, of white corn produced in Mexico yeah. that goes to feed people and 10 million metric tons, round number that's imported, uh, that's yeah. yellow corn for animal feed. The, there is a, a, another very important thing. A, a, nothing is a black or white. Mm -hmm. There are transitions in, in agricultural systems and we cannot expect that things are going to be uh, from one day to another like right. we want. No? Um, 
um, because the mindset I was talking about and before and because the the landscape of uh, Cuban agriculture uh, we have for the next years to come uh, to continue applying industrial even if I am against uh, or let's say against or not in agreement mm -hmm. with industrial agriculture at this scale and so on uh, I uh, yeah it's, it's a reality that we have to continue um, farming big part of our agricultural lands with industrial agriculture and conventional agriculture. There's no other way. We have not enough money. We have not enough capacities to, to build that paradise in the whole country. That's why I think many, many uh, specific paradises or many specific sustainable agriculture projects should be implemented in order to have enough uh, impact in the territories to transform step by step the landscape of Cuban agriculture. And that's a, a definitively a big fight. Mm -hmm. Everyone, I think, uh, companies want money to earn money and to sell products and so on. But if we think in safeguarding our, our nation, our uh, future for our kids, for our uh, country, we need to take care of uh, health of the environment, of the people for the future. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, these issues are big just within the United States as they're having the same discussion in Cuba. We have a lot to learn from each other. We have a lot to learn about each other as the relationship is rebuilt. So I want to thank you all for, for thank the panel for coming today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, we're a law firm. Um, we don't, we all have opinions on these kind of issues, but our expertise is really in the law. So if you or people you know need some help kind of trying to figure out the legal regime here and understanding Cuba or help within Cuba, we've got the resources to help with that. So. I want to uh, first, uh, uh, before finishing, I want to, to thank Dave uh, Fredrickson for his invitation mm. to, to stay here, to uh, be part, take part of this discussion here and in the Congress uh, all this week. Thank yeah, you very Dave much. Dave is the Dave. Commissioner of Agriculture <laughs> here in Minnesota. Well, thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Thank you.